The Anwar, the, the term An is something to do with unacknowledged, unconscious, with something that is a part of, so embedded in our culture that we have to un, undo its working and uncover it. This is just a, a remarkable piece of work, and I'm wondering how did you map all this out, Maria? How did how did this come together? From and you're you're more of an artist filmmaker than a documentarian, right? It was about ten years ago that I was in Union Square uh, with my friend Pavel, who's here. He's he's also a filmmaker. And um, he was testing out a camera and he said, let's go to Union Square. And we collided with the Abraham Lincoln war veteran projection, which you see in the film. So it was really by chance. And I, I saw it and immediately grabbed the camera from him. And I said, give me that. I have to start filming. And I just, that was like my reaction. Like I have to document this, this, this is historical. And, uh, and I had commented to someone there saying, this is incredible. And uh, he said, the artist is here. Why don't you tell him in person? So I did, I, I told him, I said, this is the best, this is the best art, uh, public art piece I've ever seen, you know? And that's kind of like how this relationship uh, started. I kept going back. Uh, I told him I wanted to do a short documentary on this piece and um i started filming and um and then i just started investigating all the work that he had done i looked into it i just couldn't believe that no one ever made a documentary about an artist who has dedicated uh, most of his life to uh creating works a great deal of body of work that denounces war you know and uh, xenophobia and everything uh, attached to that war's uh, aftermath and war trauma i mean that's what i saw that was that was the narrative that i saw that there was so much uh effort time and time again throughout his um at that time it was 40 plus year career now it's 50 year career a lot of artists they do address war but Krzysztof Baditschko has done it again and again and again. And that spoke to me uh, because I had done a piece, a short piece around that time, about a year before that called Glitch Telemetry. It's just a three minute experimental film that uh, took propaganda uh, footage and reappropriated it. And uh, and I and it spoke about uh, technology and uh, uh, war and mass destruction, and it, it was actually a viral video. And what that told me is that people do want to hear about war, you know, if you present it to them in the right way, uh, they do. And this is what uh, Christoph was doing. And so I thought making a film that could expand on uh, the dialogue between art and war, um, you know, using Christoph's work as an example would be uh, to possibly uh, where the film could also in itself become an intervention. Did you realize what you were biting off when you got into this? It, and, and how did you manage it? I was taking my savings and I was sinking it into making a film that nobody wanted to fund. And so I was just a nervous wreck all the time and just always constantly thinking like, where's the funding going to come from? And it was just impossible. There was never light at the end of the tunnel. It was really like impossible. But I really thought that the ephemeral nature of this and Christoph's story, you know, that, that you see in the film, was just so really important to document it. And, it. and it was really the challenging part was getting the story right, you know, getting the art, uh, not just relying on a bunch of talking heads to tell us what this art is. It, it was very, very challenging to like draw it out from the work, from the people, uh, of showing, showing. We always say in film, 
don't tell, show, show. And it's the, the biggest, uh, the most challenging thing. Michaela, I mean, you are also so important to this work your, and your organization, More Art. How did you first come across Khrushchev's work and what was it that drew you to the project? We met just by chance. I don't know if you even remember, but it was at the um, cocktail party and we just ran into each other and started talking. And then I said, why don't we do a project together? And, you know, we had an organization, More Art was uh, founded in 2004. So at the time, it was really small, incredibly small with a very tiny budget. And so I have to thank Christophe for really trusting us <laughs> with this, because then we started this conversation uh, about what to do um, and how to do it and where. <laughs> Uh, there were a lot of different ideas that came before the the, the Lincoln projection became what um, it, it was. With Christophe, we ended up also working again, which was in uh, in Italy, and then uh, um, we did another one in New York, uh, which is the counterpoint to that. And it both looked at uh, north-south migration and how different it, it is in Europe from the way it is in the United States. What uh, I was amazed by also is that uh, uh, Christoph uh, was able to co-opt this new technology, the technology of the drone, and make it uh, um, completely subverted. Your work, and Michael put it well, it's about technology, which we often think of as anti-human in some sense, or having its own uh, ontology, whatever, separate from humans. And yet you turn it into a very humanized uh, project, a very humanized centered kind of work. And I'm just wondering, how do you, how do you negotiate that space between the, the non or even anti-human and the human through your art. I never really had uh, an issue here because being industrial design, design is, is, is about uh, being <clears throat> creating uh, objects or systems that are uh, accompanying people in their lives. So it's about uh, also uh, reaching the people and uh, observing and studying, analyzing their lives, so one could not only be useful but also contribute to their uh, to their uh, emotional or symbolic life and uh, sense of themselves and dignity and so forth. That's that was the, the the ideals, maybe utopia of industrial design of that time. Uh, you're talking about glorious period of industrial design. It's um, also standing against authorities, against alienation, against all the manipulation, control, uh, uh, protecting uh, as much as possible through design people from all of those conditions uh, and a human. That's where the interrogative design came from, which I uh, have pursued here in this in the States, working at MIT, and so forth. So I, I don't see, uh, of course, the alienating aspects of technology. It's, it's, I can observe, it's close to my heart. And uh, all of those media uh, that can really be an uh, entrapment for people and, and actually contribute to uh, miscommunication rather than communication. But at the same time, the same technologies potentially are liberating, emancipatory, and can contribute to communication. So this, this was my kind of Licht motif here in my work at MIT. Is, it, is the work positioned for the random viewer al alone, or is it also something that has an impact beyond that? First of all, the work is positioned towards those who are bringing their lives to the project. So that's the first audience, <laughs> those who speak through those monuments. And they recognize themselves as living monuments to their own traumatic events and on pedestals. So this, this is also an audience, maybe minority, but it's important audience. Then there are people who heard of this project through media, 
through various ways of advertising and also the world of mouth. Those are the informed people who come. And then there are people who are there uh, because they're always there. It's, part, it's on the kind of routine. So you have a combination of those people. Now, those people who pass by don't even pay any attention. They have other things to do in their lives. They're becoming part of the project. And by those who are there standing and taking time to watch and to hear, because somehow all of this works. So, and also people who accidentally, it's just because of this event, they, they start talking to each other. There are some cases like this. This is what Brecht would like the most, you know, when you have the, you know, the publics from different social strata, actually. Then there are people who use their uh, iPads, and, and film and transmit it to others and become then uh, those who get this this way they might come another day and also do the same so it's enormous amount that we've seen this kind of so it's it's i like all of that i like also people who don't pay any attention because uh, you know this is a public space and to this list of things that uh, sort of project out the project we can now add Maria's incredible film, because that has given uh, your work an entirely new dimension and a new resonance and will continue to do so. With some artists uh, and with Christoph, he was resistant in the beginning because there had to be trust. You know, he didn't trust me. He didn't he didn't know what was it. How was I going to represent trust his... myself? <laughs> but how was I going to represent his work, yeah. you know? Michaela probably has similar reflections here <laughs> on the process of working together. It's so hard. And of course, you as an artist, you know very well what we But also about. as teachers, because I think one of the things that I value so much about you and appreciate that comes across in all of your work is the pedagogical aspect of it. You know, it is really very, very strong, not just for the public, but also the teaching you've done through institutions. And I think we have to recognize that's embedded in our work. 